Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. I am not Mina, and I am not Jay, and I'm not Marco. Mina and Jay are somewhere in the great wide world doing things they needed to do. Uh, but I have the pleasure uh, as Ted Peck, which I have been for my whole life, uh, to be here with Marco, who he has been for his whole life, uh, to share a little time with you and talk about renewable energy and stuff that's happening. Marco? Well, I got to say, Ted, that uh, you look marvelous. You look marvelous. I love your shirt. Uh, you're well coiffed. And uh, to be on the show with my twin brother of a different mother to talk about energy, it's uh, Ted and me and energy. So it's uh, it's so uh, appreciated. That, uh, and I'm grateful that you were able to uh, to be our, our host today. So thank you so much for coming into the studio and having fun with me today. It's always fun to chat with you. And uh, that's alliteration, not onomatopoeia, right? It's alliteration. That was good. That was a really good, uh, what did you say? It was uh, Ted and, uh, no, anyway. Ted, Ted and me and energy. Ted and me and energy, yes. Not, not Ted enemy, but right. Ted and me and energy. Yes. Very cool. Well, let's 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 take the dive in this precious time that we have together. So uh, you you come with quite the pedigree. You're a uh, naval midshipman from Annapolis. You spent some time deep under the water in uh, some of America's uh, uh, submarines. Uh, you are now working, have been working in Hawaii and renewable energy for for a number of years. And you were Linda Lingle's uh, energy chief, if I'm not mistaken, uh, under her administration for a time in in DBED. So. Uh, so how did you come to, to see the, uh, the good side of the force in terms of uh, renewable energy? I'd be really curious to hear your path, uh, how, how you came to Hawaii, and how you uh, ended up doing what you're doing now. Well, first of all, saying I have a good pedigree sounds like I'm a purebred dog, <laughs> uh, which I, you know, I, take, I, I, I feel honored that you would call me a purebred, because nobody's ever called me a purebred. So. Um, because I'm a mutt, right? But uh, how how I came into renewable energy, uh, when I was working uh, for Booz Allen, I was with Booz Allen here in town for 12 years. Um, we started exploring what was happening in renewable energy. And, uh, you know, renewable energy just has a lot of upside, um, you know, from an environmental perspective, from a financial perspective, from an energy independence perspective. There's just a lot of reasons. And so when I had the opportunity uh, to go work at the state, I, I know a lot of folks uh, associate with, with Linda Lingle, and, and I, you know, I don't have a problem with that, but uh, I do remind people that I was a civil servant, came into the civil servant um, force via the normal civil servant process. And I left the state uh, not because uh, the Lingle administration came to an end, but because I had something that I had to go do. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I got into real energy. And, and yeah, I was, uh, I was part of uh, state government for the first three years of the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, and it was, a, uh, it was an exciting and, and heady time. What were some of you, and before I forget, and I apologize for not uh, not introducing you with your current title, which is that you are uh, CEO of Holu Energy, and how about sharing with me and with us uh, what Holu does and what Holu has been uh, doing in terms of accomplishments over the past uh, year or two? Yeah, so uh, Holu Energy has been around for about two and a half years. Um, we mostly do microgrid development for commercial and industrial clients, helping people figure out what is their best net present value of savings for commercial facilities. Um, that's the approach that we take. Uh, we, we help businesses uh, look at their energy situation and figure out how to stabilize and reduce their costs while add value uh, and that value often comes from energy storage, uh, doing some things for them that uh, just a pure, 
PV couldn't do or what grid electricity uh, is is limited in being able to do. So that's that's our focus. We also do, um, we're involved in an offshore wind farm development. Uh, I've been involved with progression wind since 2012. Uh, that's an ongoing process. Um, but our, you know, most of our our focus is on uh, microgrid uh, development in the commercial space. Where would you, how would you describe kind of where the market is at right now in terms of what Holu is is offering? Is it, uh, uh, are we just kind of in the infancy of, uh, of uh, what we hope to be a growing uh, trend and a growing market? Or do you think things, uh, do you feel things are, are well underway? Kind of where, where do you see the evolution of, of where we're at? That's a great question. Um, you know, at one point, uh, I just saw uh, Dunkirk and the Darkest Hour, and um, I've always, uh, the, the, the speeches that Churchill gave were really powerful in that time. And one of the things he said, um, I think it was after the Africa campaign, he said, we're not at the, the end, we're not at the beginning of the end, we're more like at the end of the beginning. Um, and I think, you know, when I think about uh, the area of the build out of a set of distributed energy systems in a particular grid, you know, you kind of look at what uh, the capacity is, and capacity is a measure of uh, basically rooftops, the amount of rooftops or the amount of um, land that you could fill, um, also limited by the amount of load that you have. Um, we had an era that has come to an end where that second measure is really by how many kilowatt hours over a 24 hour, actually over an annual cycle, are available to build generation to fill up. That was uh, when the net energy metering process ended, when the NEM process ended um, in October of 2015, that was really the beginning of the end of that session because uh, that was when they stopped taking applications. But now, most of those applications have been built out most, most, not almost all, not all of them. Uh, and so now we're in a, either a restricted export where like a customer grid supply where you receive some compensation, either customer grid supply or which is CGS or CGS plus, which is just starting, you know, CGS was some amount of compensation. CGS plus is a lower amount of compensation. So we're really moving into the era, the kind of the second wave which is a non-exporting era when um, rather than treating the grid like a battery that is perfect, you don't have to pay for it, now you have to pay for it. CGS is analogous to you paying for the grid to store your energy, CGS and CGS Plus. Now you can actually store your energy. And as uh, you know, the data is still kind of, kind of coming in, this beginning of this era of uh, people self-supplying their power, where they, they generate the power, and any power that they can't consume at that time, they store it and then use it uh, at another time. So it's kind of like the beginning of everybody having a refrigerator for their energy rather than having to go buy food every day. Um, so. I think we're kind of at the beginning of that phase, uh, maybe a little bit past, you know, maybe the end of the beginning. That's my, my Churchill quote. I like that twist. I, yeah. I appreciate you quoting Winston. He's, uh, he was quite the towering figure for so many, so many years. He was very pithy, you know. Very pithy. Yeah. I think you mentioned uh, the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative early on. I think, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, we're going on about 10 years uh, now since that was announced. Uh, how would you judge the uh, the progress that the state has made towards the goals uh, stated and agreed to in terms of the the, the kind of pole star which which we uh, various stakeholders agreed to to try to aspire to reaching? Uh, what kind of progress, or how would you judge the progress that, uh, that the state has made over the past 10 years? 
Well, we're on track to hit our targets, right? Uh, the next target is in 2020, where 30 percent of, uh, of the amount of energy sold by the utility, 30% uh, of that comes from renewable energy, and that's even kind of a misnomer the way I say it, that 30% that of that number is the amount of energy that has to be on the grid. Right now, um, from the, uh, the RPS report for the, the ECO companies, they're at uh, just short of 27%. Um, which is about 17% that they're um, buying from independent power producers and selling to their customers. And about 10% of that is uh, people in the community self-generating. Um, if you look at the graphic that shows the trends over the last 10, 11 years, um, it's kind of breathtaking how Rooftop solar has really moved to be well and away the largest single source of energy of all these different renewable resources. I think to you know to be pointed about your question, there's some uh, interesting data. You know, wind actually has kind of moved up, but here in the last year it came down a little bit. You know, there were less kilowatt hours generated in 2017 from wind than there were in 2016. I'm not certain if that's uh, what that's due to. It may be due to curtailment, where there just isn't load on the grid, uh, and so that wind gets um, kind of curved back, or if it just wasn't as windy. I mean, that's very much a possibility. So I, I don't, I don't have an answer. Um, we added a boiler for H power, uh, and yet the amount of energy we're getting out of H power has not gone up significantly. Um, that's a little perplexing. I think um, just as uh, biodiesel, you know, um, the uh, Pacific Biodiesel has done, you know, leadership yeoman work in um, taking ready feedstocks, you know, waste oil, and converting that, um, refining that into biodiesel. Um, but that's a limited feedstock too. You know, we only have so much trash. We only have so much waste oil. You know, so we really haven't made significant progress in actually growing crops that we're converting into energy. Um, Pacific Biodiesel. You know, um, Robert and Kelly King are uh, are it's, it's that they're definitely leaders in that, and they're growing sunflowers on Maui and looking to see if that's going to be. Uh, a crop that pencils. Uh, one of the things that came out of not just the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative was started in 2008. 2008 is when we had the big economic collapse that led to the <coughs> stimulus bill that led to millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, actually billions of dollars that uh, went to um, into, into new development of energy. And one of the areas that was very uh, promising at the time was algae to energy, taking algae and being able to process it cost effectively and make oil, and actually not just oil, but um, oil based products that are uh, what they term drop in fuels, basically being able to make gasoline and diesel from algae products that you can move, put into any kind of uh, transportation vehicle. Um, that wouldn't need to be adjusted on the hardware side. Um, that they were able to do that, but they weren't able to do that cost effectively. And then when the price of oil dropped, uh, that kind of killed those initiatives. So um, a lot of the folks in the algae world have gone into food and into pharmaceuticals. That technology is there, but is not yet cost effective, and that's. Um, that, that was a, a disappointment. Uh, we're about to go into a break, Marco, so why don't we come back and um, I can finish answering that question uh, after the break and we can further explore where HCI is today. Great. Sound good? Thank you. Okay. Yep. Great. We'll be right back. Hey, aloha. Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. 
we have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Okay, we're back. Deep breath. We're back and we're live, and it's Ted and me and Energy. And again, I'm so pleased to have uh, Ted. I sometimes call him Theodore because it reminds me of Theodore Cleaver and Leave It to Beaver, and that was uh, that was a staple back when I was a, a kid. So once again, great to have you here, Ted. You mentioned earlier on uh, the the word uh, microgrid. I wonder if you could uh, explain to us uh, what what does a microgrid mean, and why why should we care? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question because uh, people throw around microgrid um, without really defining it, uh, much as Henry Kurz would say, we talk about renewable without really defining it. Um, the way that I've seen microgrid, I've seen some pretty heavy duty definition of microgrid, but I think it's actually much simpler than people make it. A microgrid is simply co-located load and generation with the ability to dispatch, meaning the ability for that generation to meet the load as the load varies, the generation can go and meet that load. Now, uh, while microgrid is not necessarily islanded, islanded meaning disconnected from a broader regional geographic grid, uh, but it, uh, it, it can, you can have a microgrid that can islands, or you can have a microgrid that doesn't island, and where the grid it works in conjunction with the larger grid to meet load. Um, but it, but the core idea of a microgrid is co-located generation and load with the ability to dispatch, and that ability to dispatch means effectively storage, energy storage. You can store energy and deliver it as load requires it. I got to say, Ted, you hit that one out of the park. If somebody had asked me that question, I would be fumbling a heck of a lot more than you did. So, well, now you don't have so to, Marco. It's very simple. <laughs> if I have questions, I know who I can always fall back to, Ted, to to provide clarity into the darkness, dark recesses of my limited information. So, so great answer. So, why why should we care? What difference is it going to make to uh, to rate payers writ large? and to our utility companies in terms of, I, I'm assuming that you hope to and want to see a growing um, proliferation of microgrids across, uh, across our islands. Would that be a fair statement? Uh, I think that's a fair statement. Um, I think, um, now I love history, as you could probably gather. Um, you know, over 100 years ago, really now about 120 years ago, 125, uh, Almost every, um, actually we'll go back a little, maybe 130 years ago, the world started, electricity started as a microgrid phenomenon. If you had a building, you had a generator in that building, and that generator powered your lights and whatever machinery you had. And what happened over that first 30 years of the age of electricity uh, is that um, industry found that it was more cost effective to have a larger central station generator that would feed power to multiple buildings and uh, be able to cross level load and because you had a bigger generator you could drive down your cost of generation and, uh, and so all of all, you could drive down the cost of energy. And then in the, um, like in the, in, the, in the beginning of the century, uh, it was industry that went and said, hey, I think that it's going to be best for everybody if we are regulated by the states, because that does two things. Primarily, it drives down their cost of money, because delivering uh, 
energy, electricity is a very capital intensive business, so it requires debt. And so if we could drive down our cost of money, we could both drive down the cost of delivered energy and we could drive up our profit margin as well and be more survivable. You know, profit margin, unlike some, I, I, th I don't think it's a bad word. I think profit margin is just, hey, we did good and we're getting return for being good. And what we get for being good uh, means that if we go through a bad turn, we're not going to die because we've got some resources to go. So, so, uh, so we're certainly not seeing microgrids just in the state of Hawaii. I mean, it's uh, on the U.S. mainland as well. See, I Marco, he's getting example. ahead of me here. Let me finish, and then we'll I'm come so back sorry. to that. The so bottom sorry. line, though, is that central station in a fossil-based grid is typically, the, was at the beginning the most cost-effective. But renewable, especially solar, is by nature a distributed resource. The sun falls on everybody's property. And so taking that energy from the sun, by necessity, takes distributed generation. And to have distributed generation that is stable, because we're still going to have a grid, you need a microgrid where you have the ability to store. And so, you know, rather than, you know, for the first era, the NEM era, PV was a net negative on grid stability. Microgrids turn PV into a net positive because the battery that's associated with that acts as a buffer or a sponge. The grid becomes more spongy rather than once an electron goes on the grid, it's got to be consumed immediately. With storage, you have a, a way station that energy can go into either from the grid or from renewable generation, distributed generation. It could go into a battery and then it could be made available when the load needs it. And so it makes the grid more resilient, more spongy. In fact, HOLU, HOLU um, is the word uh, that comes from what the taro leaf does in the wind and the rain, how it bounces and is resilient. So HOLU in Hawaiian really means resilient and replies resiliency. Oh, I'm very, very appreciative that you explained that because I did not know that was the meaning of the Hawaiian word holu, so appreciate that. So you're making a case for microgrids being in the best interest of pretty much all concerned, ratepayers, uh, grid operators, utility companies. What's been your experience here in Hawaii so far in terms of the degree to which you perceive uh, the Hawaiian Electric Companies uh, being uh, supportive and uh, and desirous of wanting to see uh, microgrids proliferate. Well, I I I I do not even deign to speak for the eco companies. Um, uh, I will say that uh, there is a recognition and a value proposition that the commission is seeing for distributed services. You know, grid services being made available on the grid so that. Uh, the grid operator has the ability to reach out to other resources that are likely going to be uh, more cost effective than the central station resources that just bring some of that frequency management, that voltage management, especially on a circuit level. Um, so uh, again, you know, a microgrid, you know, which is storage, um, and uh, well, storage, whether it's in a microgrid or just standalone storage, uh, delivers value to the grid both on a system wide basis and on a circuit basis. Um, in fact, there's a uh, Kavala Analytics is doing a project where they're looking at what really is the value uh, for on, on a circuit level for distributed assets. Uh, not just, uh, you know, HECO is um, taking a good step forward, but their approach to date is really on a system level. Uh, and I, I think that that's probably, for the utility, the right answer at this point. But once uh, they have kind of done a test drive on a system level, I, I think the next step would be to look at how do we provide um, circuit level uh, grid services and value those on a circuit level. Uh, what's happening is that the grid is becoming a very complex animal. 
how uh, how the grid operates with not just central station generation kind of in a in a spider pattern all just going out to all the ends of those circuits but uh, central station combined with distributed generation with storage uh, and grid services coming from not just central station but from all over the grid so we are uh, we are really in a very formative, exciting uh, time, but also a very un unnerving time for people who, you know, don't like change, you know, uh, that's hard. You know, when I was at the state, we would say, um, change hurts, transformation hurts all over. So <laughs> we are, we're, we're kind of used to it to a degree, but uh, we still have some, um, some stormy weather ahead and making those changes happen. In the little bit of time we have left, Ed, let me ask you kind of a cut to the chase question about storage. So right now there is uh, Senate Bill 2100 that is going to be heard on Wednesday in the Senate Ways and Means Committee, also known as the Money Committee. Do you support the state of Hawaii coming up with a separate tax credit for uh, energy storage, similar to, uh, to what would give the ITC would allow for as long as the storage is, let's say, 75 or more percent charged by renewable energy source, do you believe that it's a reasonable expenditure of, of, of general fund dollars for the state to be involved in supporting essentially the retrofit of both uh, more commercial size storage to existing PV and, and what I do, which is residential storage to existing rooftop solar. What's your position on the state getting involved in terms of uh, a state, separate state tax credit for storage? So that's a real inside baseball question. So with the minute that we have remaining, let me see if I can avoid answering it well. <laughs> you stinker. Um, I think that, uh, first of all, um, the IRS, the federal government, and the state have said that the existing credits that are in place allow for storage as part of a renewable energy system. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail because of limited time, but right. those are the, the, the federal government has provided some, some uh, granularity about what that looks like. Uh, the state has basically said it's part of the system. And the state's protected um, from overspending money to date because of uh, the credit is capped. On a per-system per basis, the credit is capped. So the real question, uh, 2100 does two things in its current instantiation. One is it starts a uh, decrease of the credit, which has already been happening because the cost per PV for, per watt has been going down. Uh, so that decrease has been happening. Um, the standalone storage has a value proposition. If the state wants to incent it, that makes sense to me. It has a policy strength that, uh, and a policy objective that standalone storage is meeting. And so I think it, it does make sense for the state to incent it by doing a credit for standalone storage. Um, I do question, though, you know, a ramp down. You know, we're really less than a third of the way towards our 100% goal. So finishing, um, so for kind of closing out incentives, which uh, really are there to help us meet our objective, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, I don't know if I didn't answer that question adequately or not, but there you go, Marco. No, you did, you did, that's great, and we'll know more in the weeks to come, and I think it's gonna come down to a conference committee in early May uh, to see whether something like this gets to the governor's desk. So uh, there are more, more interesting news to come. It's always fun to get nerdy with you, Marco. I always <laughs> enjoy that. Twin sons of different mothers. Thank you so much, Ted. It's been, uh, it's been great to have you. I hope we could go on for hours and hours, but our time is limited. So till the next time, I assume. And we'll see uh, Mina and, and Jay here with you next time, I assume. And uh, I'll see you at a cold pancake next time you're on island. Yes, fresh uh, coconut sauce and a little bit of maple on the side, please. There you go. Okay. Well, thank you, viewers. I hope you enjoyed uh, eavesdropping on our chat, and uh, you have a great week. Thanks again. You rock, Ted. Thank All you right. so much for coming in. Bye-bye, Marco. Bye-bye.